It's Cash, welcome back. Today I'm going to do transition pictures for Norma Jean Mortensen, otherwise known as Marilyn Monroe. Now let me say before I do this that there is a little bit of disturbing imagery in this set of pictures. So if you're really sensitive or you're triggered easily, maybe this isn't the one for you. Uh, it's not all the way through them, but enough at the very beginning that you either might want to fast forward past them or simply not watch them altogether. It's not so much that the pictures are bad, but the description of what they involve might be a little bit too much for some people. So uh, don't watch this if you're very sensitive. It's not worth it. Alrighty, but uh, yeah, we're going to do uh, Marilyn Monroe. She died of a massive barbiturates overdose. She was found by a psychiatrist in her house in Brentwood and uh, then the physician declared her dead. But she began as a factory worker. She was working in a factory and a photographer came along and said, hey, do you want to be a, f a model? And she goes, yeah, sure, whatever. And so uh, he took some photographs. She was noticed. She got a couple of movies out of that, one of which was 1947 called Scudder Who, Scudder Hey. <laughs> uh, which understandably went nowhere and then she went back to modeling but after that she obviously in the 1950s had a whole string of really big movies including Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Bus Stop, How to Marry a Millionaire, Some Like It Hard and so on. Basically exploiting this uh, dim blonde bimbo image but in actual fact it was a total fabrication it was an archetype that she was exploiting. And she was way smarter than that. She had her own production company, actually. And so eventually, while that made a ton of money, I think her movies, translated to today's money, probably grossed around $2 billion. In today's money, $2 billion. She was a massive success. But that success began to wear down because she hated in the end being objectified. She hated all the attention. And of course it brought out, as fame does, all her insecurities. Because in her childhood, she was in orphanages, she was fostered out, she had a mother who was in a mental asylum, and it was very, very hard for her as she was growing up. She wasn't stable to begin with, so that when she became ultra-famous and rich, she not only kept marrying different guys, I think she married three times, but she also ended up with depression and uh, drug problems, alcohol problems or whatever. It really destroyed her in the end, the fame. So when I went into her energy, unsurprisingly, the pictures were a little disturbing. You know when automobile manufacturing companies abandon a factory, right? And they take all the machinery out, all the workers go, all the chains go, and all this stuff they, that they have to make cars with is removed. And what they're left with is a gigantic hangar. This environment that I saw was like that. Empty, abandoned, desolate, you know, broken windows, trickles of sunlight coming in, dust in the air, odd tools lying around the place, abandoned. And in the middle of this darkness was... Marilyn Monroe, but floating, head down, gazing at the ground, not moving. Weirdly, there was a beam of light came in and shone on her back. It kind of illuminated half of her, the back half. And I walked around her and she was just floating there, not moving. And when I was able to see her face, there was no face. In fact, her face, what would have been her face, 
was almost hanging off in a way to allow me to see inside her head. And inside her head was black and hollowed out. Her body was black and hollowed out. There was nothing there. It felt like the world had taken her very insides, her soul, her being, and shoehorned it out and just left the shell. And all the shell could do was float there, full of regrets, pain, confusion. sense of loss, of loneliness, empty shell. After a while, she suddenly started moving. No idea why. She moved across this gigantic space. And over here, there was a very, very broad corridor. And she moved, floating, down this corridor. And it went on for a very long time. On and on and on. Just floating like this. Floating, floating by. In silence. It was effortless, but spooky. Almost like she was haunting the place. That's what it felt like. Like she was not just... A shell of her former self, but a ghost of her former self. And at the end, there was a corner to turn. She goes into this room, and this is where it really lost me. I don't understand why this happened or why it was here. But there was what seemed to me like a flying saucer. It was like shiny chrome, a big disc of shiny chrome that looked like a flying saucer, a grounded flying saucer. I have no idea what that is. And walking around it didn't help because I looked at it and it just seemed like a flying saucer. But it was shiny, it was new, it was metallic, and it took up virtually the whole room. She ignored it. Not the slightest bit interested in whatever this disc was. She had her eyes on this room at the far end. It had windows. She floated up to one of the windows and looked in. And inside was a dome-shaped structure. It was metal it was rusted, and it was the shape of the normal dome. But she couldn't get in because there were windows. She goes around, and now there's something I felt that was almost like yearning. A yearning to be put to rest. A yearning for this to end. The emptiness, the sadness... The sense of, of emotional ruin, of being unloved, of being confused, of being objectified. Whatever they'd taken from her, it was now gone, and the remainder she wanted to be put to rest. And, I guess intuitively, she knows that the dome that she has to enter, the membrane that I always see as being the final entering the light moment, is encased inside this metal dome, inaccessible. And she feels like this too? I'm not even allowed to have this? This has to be a struggle as well? I have to fight for this. There was real yearning there. Frustration. 
annoyance even. She didn't do anything, actually, other than just hover there, looking at this thing, trying to puzzle how to get in. But as she was puzzling, the top unscrewed. There was like a, a manhole cover type thing on the top, and it unscrewed and gave her the clue she needed to how she was going to sort this out. But it wasn't going to come easily to her. Around the side of this metal dome was a set of stairs. Maybe the challenge is to sort things out at a spiritual level before you can be allowed to pass. Maybe if you're this troubled as she was, you bring this amount of baggage with you. The universe goes, no, 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 because you don't bring that stuff with you. You leave that behind. Remember I said you leave behind expectations, attachments, artifice, and control. Well, maybe there wasn't control, but those other three could be what she was carrying. And only by wearing her down to the point where, oh God, anything, just let me in, just let me through, just let me rest and be at peace. Maybe the universe held off to the very end because she had to shed these encumbrances. Weary, she sets off up these stairs, gets to the top, and through the hole of the metal dome, she can see the gleam of the real one. This is it. She's here. Worn down. Unable to resist any more, and unwilling to hang on to anything that had gone before. She stared at the dome for a little while. And just fell in, like a belly flop. In and gone. I know that there are people who have so much confusion, chaos, turmoil, anguish when they're children that their adult life is spent conjuring up the same chaos because weirdly, perversely, it's where they feel comfortable. They understand chaos because they've had to deal with it for years. Uncertainty, not feeling loved, and so on. They've, they've dealt with that because they know about it. And so they, maybe unconsciously, but they create that kind of thing, that, those kind of circumstances in the world. Also, energetically, they bring the same experiences in because that's where their vibration is at. And that's what it felt like with uh, Marilyn Monroe. When I found her, she was still in that transition moment of there's nothing left of me. The pieces have been removed that enabled me to function properly. And all she was waiting to do was shed what she didn't need, shed what was holding her back, and then go to the light. But a part of her, the part that was used to chaos, was used to feeling hurt, abandoned, lonely, powerless. That bit she couldn't let go of because she was so used to it. 
As I said in one of my books, we are the architects of our own undoing. And maybe in the transition process, that applies as well. And we have to undo the undoing before we can uh, fully enter the light at the end. But in any case, unconditional love is there waiting for us and saying, come on, just shed it all. Come on. You'll be whole here. No judgments. Nobody wants anything from you. You can be yourself. That's what I felt from Marilyn Monroe. Alrighty, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.